Good afternoon, everybody. We'll get started. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have Wen Ying Xu here today. Um, Wen Ying uh, got her undergraduate degrees in, in both math and biology at Pomona. Um, and as you'll see, she has kept both those interests together over the years. Um, so she did her graduate work at Caltech with Ray Deshaies, working on uh, mitotic exit in, in Saccharomyces. And then for her postdoctoral work, uh, she decided to, she wanted to do things that were different. <laughs> and uh, did a very adventurous uh, postdoc starting at the Rockefeller and then at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where she created um, a model system for a mixed microbial communities with two yeast strains that now required each other for, for survival. And then, and then, so she created that system. And then, then in 2007, she moved to the Hutchinson Center in Seattle, where she uh, has been ever since. Um, and her, her work there continues to use that model system, both experimentally and for modeling, for computational modeling, to look at questions of, the, in these mixed microbial communities, uh, co cooperation and cheaters in the, in the evolution of those populations, and also how structure can evolve within those populations. And she's going to tell us about some of that work today. Thank you very much. Can people hear me? Yes? Good. And actually, after my um, talk, I will open questions to trainees first, and then to the faculties. OK, so let's get started. Um, so is it pointer? Maybe I don't need a pointer. There's usually one up here. It's okay, I can't always That's point. Fine. That's fine, that, that is not a problem. Okay, so, so thank you everyone for um, coming to my talk. So instead of diving into a couple stories in depth, I will serve a platter of appetizers. And these appetizers together will give you a flavor of my or our scientific journey. So my talk will consist of two parallel threads, evolution of cooperation, and the power of mathematical thinking. So back in college, as Aaron mentioned, I double majored in math and biology. I did mathematical proofs, and I did biology experiments. I wanted to combine the two, but it was not clear to me how. In grad school, I was forced to choose. In that time, there was no systems biology and so on and so forth, right? So I chose biology. I studied uh, mitotic exit because that was the coldest part of the red hot cell cycle field. So I studied how the budding yeast exited mitosis using molecular genetics and biochemistry. I learned a lot. At the end of it, I published a very high profile paper. But two weeks later, a very similar paper appeared in a different high profile journal. So that is a, cru a very cru almost cruel right, awakening. So I asked myself, I didn't want to just advance science by two weeks. That's not what I want, right? So I must do something different. So I started to wonder, what about the mathematics? I love the mathematics and I missed it. Would the mathematics give me the second microscope that would allow me to see things that otherwise I would not be able to see? So I took a chance. I went to a physics and biology lab at the Rockefeller, and I was given complete freedom. So I spent a whole year fishing for projects, and at the end of it, I got interested in game theory and the major transitions in evolution. Let me start. So cooperation is thought to drive major evolutionary transitions. From independent replicators, that, that is bits and pieces of nucleic acids that are capable of self-replicating to being stitched together to form chromosomes where replication becomes synchronized from unicellularity to multicellularity, from individuals to society. All these major transitions involved, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, but. Oh, good, good, okay, very good. Thank you very much. So all these major transitions involved cooperation between units at the lower level to form collectives at the higher level. But all these cooperative systems are vulnerable to cheaters. In a human society, 
we know that the seeds exist. And in a multicellular organism, cancers are cheaters of the system. And for chromosomes, transposons are cheaters. How might the cooperation survive cheaters? So in this slide, I want to define more carefully cooperation and the constraints of cooperation. And then we are looking at the net gain of an individual. So when there is no cooperation, the net gain is zero by definition. A cooperator pays a cost C to generate a benefit B greater than C. So if a cooperator interacts with another cooperator, the net gain of the cooperator is B minus C greater than zero. So the first constraint of cooperation is simply partner availability. A cheater pays zero cost and it generates zero benefit. So if a cooperator interacts with a cheater, the net gain of the cooperator is minus C, whereas the net gain of the cheater is B. So B is greater than minus C. So that is the second constraint of cooperation, cheater invasion. So as because cheaters are more fit than cooperators, the cheating population will take over. So in the end, the cheaters will mainly interact with other cheaters, and then we go back to the original baseline of zero. So how might cooperation have evolved to cope with these constraints? So when I started, there, there was a lot of study already on cooperation within species. So a key mechanism is kin selection, that is, you help your relatives, either because you recognize them or because you live in the same household, so you interact preferentially with your relatives. And that kind of preferential interaction would stabilize cooperation. So I don't want to study that, right? So that is you know, already studied intensely. So instead, I wanted to study cooperation between species or mutualisms, where genetic relatedness is less likely to play a direct role in stabilizing cooperation. I also want a system that is experimentally tractable because existing systems have evolved for millions of years and it is very hard to retrace the evolutionary trajectory. So I want a system that is genetically tractable so I could watch how a cooperative system could evolve from the very beginning. And the third, I want this to be quantifiable. That is, from phenotypes of cooperators, I want to quantitatively understand the success of cooperation. And this has two uses. The first, it will tell me what drives the success of cooperation. And the second, it gives me expectation, right? So if I expect how successful it should be, and then I would know what's a surprise and what's not a surprise. So I started uh, and to engineer my own uh, system of cooperation with cheating using my friend, and the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So the first strain cannot make a lysine due to a deletion mutation in the lysine biosynthetic pathway. It overproduces adenine due to a mutation in the first enzyme of the adenine biosynthetic pathway that renders the enzyme to be resistant to end product inhibition feedback control. So as a result, the cell just produces lots of adenine. And I call this L minus A plus for obvious reasons. So the complementary strain cannot make adenine but overproduce lysine and the overproduced metabolites are released into the environment. To be precise, it's actually not adenine that's released, but rather hyperxanthine, a derivative of adenine that's released. So the, for simplicity of this talk, I would just call adenine, I would just call hyperxanthine adenine. So this system I name as COSMO for cooperation that is synthetic and mutually obligatory. And uh, um, these are reproductively isolated strains so they may be regarded as different species. And we can also engineer cheaters that you know, cannot make lysine, but it just makes enough adenine for itself. It does not overproduce adenine, and thus does not contribute any adenine to the environment. And we can label the three strains with different colors so we could track the population dynamics. So now the question is, of course, do cooperators actually pay a cost to overproduce these metabolites? So Adam Wake, a former graduate student in my lab, showed that the answer is yes. So in this experiment, he competed the lysine-requiring cheater with the lysine-requiring cooperator in excess nutrients. And look at the ratio over generations. 
And you see that the ratio is increasing, suggesting that cooperators does pay a fitness cost. So this is important, right? So this shows that cheaters grow faster than cooperators. And the same thing is true also for the other strain. So this is a bona fide cooperation system in the sense that each strain had to pay a cost to generate the benefit to help the partner. So I would argue that COSMO is a, a great a model system for naturally occurring cooperation because nutrient exchanges are common. For example, between legume and the rhizobia, where the legume um, would provide photosynthesis to rhizobia, and the rhizobia provide fixed nitrogen to legume. Nutrient exchange also occur between the host and the gut microbiota. And if we generalize nutrient exchange to benefit exchange, we have many more examples. One example is between figs and fig wasps. So where the figs provide the wasps with food, and the wasps carry out pollination for the figs. And the beauty of Cosmo is that it has something common to all of them. That is, both partners pay a cost to support the, uh, both strains pay a cost to support the partners but it is stripped away of all the complexities that are idiosyncratic to each of these systems. And by, simp by this uh, simplification, we hope to learn general principles. And I will tell you a few examples of these general principles uh, throughout my talk. So the first example of this um, general principle is strong cooperation promotes species coexistence. So in this experiment, we mix the three strains at the top panel, 1,000 to 1, the middle panel, 1 to 1, and the bottom panel, 1 to 1,000. And then we tracked how the ratios changed over time. And then we see that regardless of the starting ratio, the steady state ratio is close to the dotted line of 1. So they can stably coexist. And the reason is actually intuitive. If you started the two populations at extreme ratios, now the benefits exchange would also be extreme. That means that the rare population would have lots of benefits, um, but these abundant population would compete for this very limited benefit. So this would mean that the rare population will grow faster than the abundant population, allowing the ratio to be more balanced. So stable ratio is also observed in natural mutualism, such as in methane generating communities and in anaerobic methane oxidizing communities. So we want to understand uh, how the robustness of Cosmo might change during evolution. So I define robustness as the ability of a community to survive a perturbation. There are many different types of perturbations, right? So one type of perturbation is a drastic dilution, such as that occurring after antibiotic treatment, where the vast majority of the community would be killed. Or during fecal transplant, where only a small fraction would be able to colonize the host. So conceptually, this purple community would be diluted drastically, but it was able to grow back up. But this green community could not even survive a more mild form of dilution. So we can, so this, the green community would be less robust than the purple community, and we can define that as viability, or the minimal total cell density required for a community to regrow. So a different form of perturbation is frequent dilution, such as those occurring during waste treatment or during regular bowel movements, where there are, um, there are periodic inflows and outflows. So conceptually, again, this purple community would grow, and it would be diluted, and it would grow, and be diluted. And because this is growing faster than the, um, than the dilution rate, it can survive. In contrast, this green community, because it grew slower than the dilution rate, it will be washed out. So then we can quantify uh, the robustness against frequent dilutions using community growth rate or the rate of total population increase. So the faster you grow, the more likely you will survive um, these dilutions, these frequent dilutions. So how might the robustness of Cosmo change during evolution? So first I want to um, evolve them in an uh, environment unfavorable for cooperation, right? That's my control. I want to see Cosmo fail when it's supposed to fail. So social evolution theory predicts that Cosmo is doomed in a well-mixed environment. 
So that's because um, cells cannot choose partners, right? They don't know which one's overproducing, which one's not. So they interact just with the, the just you know, in the uniform medium where, um, where everybody sees exactly the same concentration right, of metabolites. So that is also important, right? So in a well-mixed environment, right, the fastest growers win. Because the environment is, abiotic environment is completely uniform. Right, and here, right, the, the fastest growers win. And we know cheaters grow faster than cooperators, right? So that means that cheater mutants should take over. And as they take over, community growth rate should slow down and the community viability should reduce. So we did this, I did this experiment. I put these in cubes, in well-mixed environment, in minimal medium, lacking adenine or lysine. Let them grow to moderate densities, during which cheater mutants could arise and then perform the dilutions and repeat this process. And then I measured viability. So the, the measurement is very simple. So we take a community at a fixed density and do serial dilution, right? And then into minimal medium and then wait for a month. And for the communities that could grow up, you can see the white dots. But these, these communities could not grow back up because the cell density was too low. And it's also intuitive to understand this because if the two strains can cooperate, but if the populations are at such a low density that they cannot take up the metabolites fast enough, then they will die before they can even right, grow. And that explains the density requirement. But for evolved, uh, so this is the viability threshold. But for evolved community, we could, uh, we could improve um, the viability threshold is reduced. That means the viability has increased. And this is true for all the independent and uh, evolved lines. So these different colors in, um, represent independently evolving lines. And the y-axis is the viability threshold. That is, again, the minimal total cell density required for a community <coughs> to grow to saturation. And it's a function of generation. So all these curves showed that the viability threshold has reduced, which means that the viability has improved. For growth rate, uh, Chi Chen Chen, a former research tech in my lab, showed that the outcome was rather stochastic. So now we are um, looking at cosmo doubling time against generation. And for this green line, the doubling time has evolved to be longer, meaning that the line has evolved to grow slower. But for these red lines, they have evolved to grow faster. Right, so this right off the bat told us that these two metrics are different because this one is consistently improving and this one has stochastic outcome. But more importantly, they suggest that cooperation can evolve to be more robust, even in a well-mixed environment, predicted to be unfavorable for cooperation. So when I started the lab at the Hutch, right, so we have this at the Cosmo, we could look for cheater mutants in both populations. But that's kind of hard because you have to assay or release. So we thought, well, why not just add engineered cheaters to the system and see what, uh, what we will observe. So Adam Waite, a former graduate student, did precisely this experiment. He mixed the three strains at one to one to one in a well-mixed environment. And we are looking at the number of community doublings against time. And note, because it's a well-mixed environment, Cheaters should take over. And, the, um, and if a community doubles every fixed number of hours, you should see a straight line. Instead, all these communities started from the same master mix, yet we saw stochastic outcomes. So there were the orange colored communities that grew fast, and the gray colored communities grew slowly. And then we could look uh, using flow cytometry to look at strain compositions. So all these fast-growing communities were dominated by the cooperators, the lysine-requiring cooperators. And all these gray-colored, slow-growing communities were dominated by lysine-requiring cheaters. Then we isolated clones, um, the cooperator and cheater clones, from the fast and slow-growing communities and subjected them to whole genome sequencing. And the result was crystal clear, thanks to yeast genetics. Right? So we're looking at these two 
And it turns out that regardless of whether a cell, a clone is a cooperator or a cheater, whether it's from this or this community, they were sampling from the same pool of mutations that allowed these cells, the mutants, to compete better for the very limited lysine from the partner. So if we have a, a, a tube in some tube, the cheaters would by chance sample a more adaptive mutation than the cooperators. And in this case, the uh, cheaters will take over and you will have slow growing communities. In some other tube, the opposite would be true and the cooperators would sample, happen to sample a more thick mutation than the cheaters. And the cooperators will take over and you have cheater purging. So we call this adaptive race, the race of the two strains for adaptation to lysine limitation. And so adaptation to stress can lead to stochastic cheater purging. And this phenomenon has been observed in systems where the, the cells were not engineered, such as demonstrated in these papers. So it's not something special to our system. But what about the spatially structured environment? Because as we know, most biological interactions occur in a spatially structured environment. So Babeca Momeni, a former postdoc, mixed the three strains and put them on top of our growth pad uniformly and randomly. Again, in minimal medium, lacking adenine or lysine. So they're forced to cooperate and cheat. And then we watched for the formation of these communities. So this is a top view, experimental result, top view, the X, Y. So we see something very striking, right? So the, the red and the green cooperators formed these mixed pods, and the blue cheaters are physically isolated from these mixtures. And if we look at the vertical cross-section, the Z cross-section, it's even more striking. So the red-green cooperating partners mixed and grew tall, and the blue cheaters were relegated to the foothill and failed to grow tall. We also did um, simulations. And the simulations qualitatively captured experimental results in the sense that the red and green cells would mix, right, and grow tall, and the cheaters would be um, spatially isolated. And it just as a plug-in, right, for doing these simulations, we simulated about 10 million cells. It took us a whole week to do the simulation. And as a comparison, the human body has a million times more cells than these, right? So that highlights the importance of having a um, very good um, computational system to be able to address more complex um, biological systems. So now why is, this, why is this intermixing business, right? So again, we can intuitively um, explain that. So let's consider uh, the partner in the middle, flanked on one side by cooperators and the other side by cheaters. So now the budding yeast just buds randomly, right? So now if the red cell happens to bud toward the green partner, it will be more likely to divide again compared to if it had budded away from the partner. Right? So that leads to the piling over of the red over the green, and the same piling over would happen on the cheater side. Now the green cells are fed by these red cells, so they also grow tall. And the same logic applies to the green cells, right? So if the green cell happens to bud toward the red cells, it will be more likely to bud again compared to if it had budded away from the red cells. So that would lead to the piling over of the green over the red. And this process would repeat itself, forming this intermixed pattern. But the intermixing does not happen for the cheater side, because it really makes no difference whether you bud toward the cheater or away from the cheater. And after all, the cheater is not giving you anything. So you eventually you would die and the cheaters would also suffer. So this says that spatial self-organization isolates and it disfavors cheaters. And I want to say that this intermixing is again not unique to our engineering system because in collaboration with Matthew Fields lab, we also observed intermixing between mutualistic bacteria and archaea. So to summarize, um, Using COSMO, we discovered novel pro-cooperation mechanisms. First, adaptive race stochastically purge cheaters. Second, spatial self-organization excludes and disfavors cheaters. And as for mathematical uh, thinking, so it's nice if the, the models and experiments agree, because that provides additional support. But as far as I um, was concerned, it was more like 
really a cherry on top of the biology cake, right? Because I can publish the work without any modeling, just fine. But with model, it's just nice because it's additional level of support. And it also shows that all the assumptions, right, like the assumptions are sufficient to qualitatively explain experiments. So for the remaining of the talk, I will show you how mathematics has evolved to become our essential second microscope. So let's do a flashback to my postdoc time. So the original plan of attack is I want to quantitatively understand community robustness, like growth rate, viability, in terms of the phenotypes of cooperators. I was told it's not possible. And the reason I was given is that it is difficult to measure parameters. Yeah, models have parameters, and the parameters need to be measured. And it's just not possible to measure all parameters. But I was thinking, you know, Cosmo is simple, right? If you think about the, the lysine requiring cells, all I need to measure is how many femtol of, femtomol of lysine is required to make a new cell, how much adenine is released by the cell per hour, and then the growth rate of this cell at various concentrations of lysine. And I will do this for the other strain. But it turns out that if you do some back of envelope calculation, it's even simpler than that. Right? If you want to understand the steady state growth, community growth rate, it's approximately the square root of the product of the two release rates divided by the product of the two consumption amount. So I'm not going to lead you to the derivation, but just let's do a unit, a check of unit. Right? It's a square root, femtomol lysine per cell per hour, femtomol adenine per cell per hour, divided by femtomol lysine per cell, femtomol adenine per cell. I can cancel this out, I can cancel this out, and I get per hour. And that's exactly the unit of growth rate. And uh, so that showcases the power of mathematical thinking, right? Because it helps experimental design, right? Because I don't need to measure that many. I only need to measure four parameters. And it might even seem odd. Why would the growth rate of individuals not matter in the community growth rate? Why is that? Right, so it turns out that if you think for a moment, it actually makes sense. Because in the Cosmo system, the nutrient supply is very limited. So imagine you're waiting for your partner to give you meals. If the partner supplies meals really infrequently, there's no point. How fa you know, how, if you eat it fast or slow, it makes absolutely no difference because you have to wait for the partner to give you the meal. And that's why the individual growth rate doesn't even show up here, right? So that I, we in, immediately reduce the number of experiments to just measuring the two release rates and the two consumption amount. So I would need to measure them in monocultures, because in co-cultures, the adenine and the lysine are so at such a low concentration, it's just not possible to measure them. And ideally, I would like to measure them in nutrient-limited environment, mimicking the Cosmo environment. But that's very challenging to keep, to keep a constant nutrient-limited environment. So I just did the approximation, right, like every experimentist would do. So I measured them in batch cultures. So for consumption, I used the excess metabolite and it, and it quantified how many cells can these metabolites be transformed to. And for release rate, I used the no-nutrient batch culture measurement. And the reasoning is because the lysine and the adenine concentrations were nearly undetectable, right? So it's you know, very little, it's approximately zero. So I just made a no-nutrient no and measured the release rates and the consumption amounts. So what did I get? These experiments, we're looking at the steady state growth rate of the ancestral cosmos. This is a model. So the model is much higher than the experiments. So you might even argue, right, well, this difference might be very small. Right? But keep in mind that growth is exponential. So even a small difference in growth rate would amplify exponentially right, in terms of the difference between predicted dynamics versus observed dynamics. So it was extremely disheartening, given that it's a very simple system and it just won't work. So of course, maybe biology is just too complicated. Right? If you think about it, there could be multiple reasons why this won't work. First, the two strains could engage in additional interactions, not engineered by me. Second, cells could be evolving while I was measuring parameters or while I was measuring the growth rate. So I decided to take a step back and to ignore this quantitative difference, right? So I only insist qualitative agreement, not quantitative agreement. 
I just don't want to chase down this rabbit hole, right? So we ignored this for as long as, as, long as we could. And as you have seen, qualitative matching between model and experiment is useful. But there was a second impasse in the lab that stalled us for multiple years and eventually forced us to confront this discrepancy. And I will talk about that impasse in a few slides. But to make the long story short, I start to ask myself if the phenotypes from these batch cultural measurements are not good enough to predict something very simple like the community steady state growth rate, why would I trust these assays? So we bite the bullet and made it chemostat. So chemostat is you know, a device devised by physicists. It's a very clever device to create a constant nutrient limited environment. How it works is the following, right? So we have lysine acquiring cells. We have a third bar stirring to make sure everything is well mixed. And because these cells require lysine, we will drip in fresh minimal medium with a fixed input concentration, right? And then the overflow, including any cells, would be flushed out. So at the um, steady state, we have fixed volume, fixed cell density. So what does a fixed cell density mean? It means that the net growth rate, which is birth minus death rate, must, it's a mathematical equality, right, must be equal to dilution rate. So that means if you want the cells to grow slowly, you just drip in this fresh minimal medium slowly. If you want them to grow faster, you just drip in more frequently. And also from some very simple mathematics, we know how to measure release rate and the consumption amount from the steady state concentrations of cells and the metabolites. So David Scalding, a physicist in the lab, spent like, actually a year making this multi-channel chemostat and to ensure the dilution rate is, can be precisely controlled. And using this set of device, Sam Hart, a former research tech in the lab, measured the phenotypes, the release and consumption phenotypes at various growth rates. So I'm only going to show you one example. The lysine release rate of A minus L plus. The blue dotted line is our, sense, uh, our assay sensitivity. So now this is the batch culture measurement that I did when I was a postdoc. And this is the release rate if we grow cells in excess metabolite, in exponential growth rate. And what's relevant for Cosmo is this region, right? And the release rate looks highly non-constant. In fact, the difference between the highest and the lowest could differ by twofold. And of course, the Sam had to, using chemostat, Sam had to battle the extremely rapid rise of mutants while doing these measurements. So we figured out how to overcome these obstacles. And then we plug in, and this actually I would like to mention that this is not special for this strain or this release rate. We saw this for consumption as well. We saw this for the other strain. So when we put this community uh, the measurements from community relevant environments into the model, what do we get? Okay, just to recall this experiment, this is from batch culture measurement. And this is a model prediction from uh, using phenotypes from chemostat. And this error bar is calculated using propagation of errors from the uncertainties of measurement of the four parameters. So finally, we achieved a quantitative match. So phenotypes measured in community-like environment allow quantitative prediction of community growth rate. And our, our work also sets example of how quantitative biology could be done for populations of cells and the obstacles there are and how we might overcome these obstacles. So now I have shown you that phenotypes of cooperators would allow us to understand the robustness of ancestral cosmo in terms of steady state growth rate. And I don't have time to show you. We can also um, understand viability. So here, the power of mathematical thinking is that mismatch between models and experiments reveals important missing pieces. In this case, the importance of doing the um, assay in the right environment. So the impasse, going back to the impasse. So at that time, we were actually busily um, ca uh, you know, classifying evolved clones from well-mixed environments. So again, from well-mixed environments, the fastest growers win. So we are focusing on the, the lysine requiring 
as populations. So every single clone would contain at least one self-serving mutation, allowing the mutants to grow faster than the ancestor in life and limitation, consistent with this, right, with this prediction. But we know that mutation can be pleiotropic. By this, I mean a single mutation can control multiple phenotypes. Right, so we were just curious, um, how might a single self-serving mutation affect the partner? It might not affect partner. It might help partner less. Right, and we call this the cheaters. And it can also help partner more. And we call this the win-win mutations, okay, self-serving and part-serving at the same time. And the reason we were interested in win-win mutations is that the, this coupling, so basically win-win mutations couple self-fitness with the ability to help partners. And this kind of coupling has been observed in natural, community, in natural cooperative communities that have evolved for millions of years. So we wanted to know whether these win-win mutations can also be found in a system with no prior history of cooperation. So we thought Cosmo would be a wonderful system to study that. So then you can ask, what is the definition of partner serving? Right, so let's look at this. Right? So the partner is this stuff, and they need adenine. So one possibility is you would say, well, if these mutants release more adenine than the ancestor, it's more partner serving. Right? And this kind of thinking is prevalent in the literature. For example, for rhizobia and the legume, the, the, the legume partner needs fixed nitrogen. So a rhizobia mutant that releases more fixed nitrogen is considered to be more cooperative or more partner helping. So the work from Sam Hart and Jose Panida showed that this is actually the wrong definition. The right definition is a higher adenine release rate per lysine consumption. That is, if a cell happens to um, release more adenine, but at the same time, it's also consuming more lysine, it may not be more partner serving. And I want to acknowledge, actually, Bruce's lab's work from Bruce Fuchs' lab, right, that helped us to realize, to come to this realization. So in translating into rhizobia, so for a rhizobia mutant to be more partner serving, it, ha it had to have increased release rate of fixed nitrogen per photosynthesis state it consumes. So this highlights the, 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 the advantage of using a simplified system where molecular genetics can really help you to get to insights like this that might be elusive for people who study more complex communities where molecular genetics is not as easy. So now partner serving. Once we know how to define this, we can measure that, right? And so this is the impasse I was talking about. So we, we have ancestor and then we have some mutant. We call it mutant X. But you can see the experimental data are highly variable. It's even more frustrating than this, right? Because in one week, we will get the results like this, right? So mutant X seems to be more partner serving than the uh, ancestor. And next week, it will be the opposite result. So we were just chasing our tails around, right? For like a couple years, until eventually we realized maybe our assays were not right. So then we redid these experiments in chemo stats. Now we have beautiful segregation of mutant X versus ancestor. And this mutant X is more partner serving. I can demonstrate that because I can show you the growth rate of partner when paired with its ancestral or mutant X L minus A plus. And indeed, the growth rate is higher when paired with mutant X compared to when paired with ancestor. So now, because mutant X is also self-serving, so this is a win-win mutation. So win-win mutants could rapidly arise and promote cooperation. And I want to say that a fraction of the self-serving mutants are also partner-serving. The rest are not partner-serving, and we're still trying to figure out what makes this a fraction of self-serving mutants so um, special. And in fact, these mutants could arise in the absence of the partner. So that said that just by you know, helping self in some sense, right, a fraction of the time, you might already be setting up the stage to help partner more. So we showed that win-win mutants could rapidly arise. And here, the quantitative thinking is important even for qualitative, qualitative conclusions, because in our case, the quantitative thinking told us which assay is right, which assay is wrong. So the, I want to say the evolution of Cosmo is not limited to increase or decrease of release or consumption. In fact, we found that new interactions can rapidly evolve so Robin Green, a former graduate student, 
found that within tens of generations of evolution, this population harbored stably a subpopulation that's methionine oxytrophic. So these cells would need external source of organic sulfurs, right, to survive. And there's, we didn't supply any organic sulfurs in the medium. So it turned out that these two populations were both releasing glutathione and glutathione conjugates, which are organic sulfurs which can support the survival of these cells. So as our lab becomes more and more comfortable with math, we ventured into new scientific domains. So one of the domains is complex microbial communities. And we know microbial communities are important for human health and for the functioning of our ecosystems. But they are complex in the sense that they have many species. And here I'll just show these S1, S2, and S3 to indicate three species. And then they engage in complex chemical mediated interactions. For example, this S3 releases a compound that inhibits the growth of S1. And this S2 releases two compounds. One inhibits and then one promotes the growth of S1. And because these chemical interactions are very hard to delineate, the field has tried to model these kind of system using a simplified framework. So the growth rate of S1 is just the growth rate of S1 alone in the absence of interacting species, plus how S2 influences S1 growth rate. And here, for example, let's assume that the activation is more than inhibition, so the net effect would be positive. And then plus how S3 inhibits S1, and so on and so forth. So in essence, it considers pairwise interactions and assumes that fitness effects are additive. And these models are called the pairwise model or the logical Volterra model. So many years, the logical Volterra model was originally devised to model how foxes, you know, chases down rabbits. Uh, but we thought, well, for microbial communities, you mean the interactions are mediated by chemicals which can be shared or competed for. So maybe this will not work for um, work as well for microbial communities. So Babeka Momeni, a former postdoc in the lab, I mean, uh, looked into this question, and he found that the pairwise model may qualitatively fail for even pairwise microbial interactions. In essence, it depends on whether a species is releasing one or two chemical compounds, whether the released chemical compound is reusable, such as an enzyme, or consumable, such as a metabolite. You will have to use different equations. And you cannot just use a single equation, like in the pairwise model, to describe all microbial interactions. So this cautions the field from the indiscriminative use of pairwise models and it provides a motivation to devise new tools for understanding, um, for theoretically understanding microbial communities. So here, um, mathematical thinking helps us critically evaluate other theoretical work. So the last vignette I wish to cover is the artificial selection of microbial communities. So microbial communities can have function defined as biochemical activity requiring the entire community. For example, we can imagine a species that converts substrates to intermediates, and a second species converts intermediates to product. Then the conversion from substrates to product is a community function because it requires both species. And so now, if I have some community function and it's low, how would I improve this community function? Right. So one approach is that, okay, I will figure out how they interact so that I would make them interact better so that the community function will be improved. But in reality, it's very difficult to do that because it's extremely difficult to delineate the interaction. Moreover, many species are not even culturable in isolation, let alone genetic manipulation. So a complementary approach is to carry out artificial selection experiments. Right, so how it works is the following. We start with a population of communities, which I will label as newborn, having few, I mean, small total cell densities. And we allow the communities to grow, and I call this period of time maturation, until they become adults. 
And then these are all defined experiment by experimentalists, how long you would live in shore. And during this time, the cells would grow, and it will intact, community function will develop. And the mutations can arise through community members. So at the end of the maturation, we will measure community function. And say if we care about the purple color, then this one would have high function, and this one will have low function. Right? Then we will choose the top performing, top functioning communities, and allow them to reproduce by splitting each into multiple newborn communities for the next cycle. So in fact, um, one would say, okay, right, and the, this kind of powerful, this approach can be very powerful because, well, first, if you are successful in doing that, you could improve community function without knowing how they interact. But I suppose you want to actually know mechanistically what's going on. You can compare ancestral and evolved communities and uh, by comparing the genomes, for example, you would get candidates, right, of genes that are important for community function. So the conventional wisdom says you get what you select for. Right? But if you look into the literature, it's not quite the case because people have tried to go to these ponds, right, near factories and try to isolate the microbial communities and select communities that are better at degrading industrial pollutants. Sometimes, the community function would decline despite selection. The problem is that there are so many experimental knobs you can consider, right? Like the number of communities on the selection, the number of cells you put in to newborns, the amount of resource you put into newborns, the duration of maturation time, the fraction of you know, high functioning communities you would select to reproduce. And it's, it's just really impractical for us to go through each of these selection protocols and see which one works the best. So Li Xie, a postdoc in my lab, um, simulated this entire process. And she found that often you don't get what you select for. But if you do it smartly, you might be able to get it to work. So she made explicit predictions in how to do these experiments effectively. Conclusions include, for example, when you do a pipetting dilution of these, the stochastic fluctuations in cell numbers might create such large variations in community function to stall your selection effort. A second is that you might want to select the top 20% rather than top 2% to, uh, to reproduce. So this is another example where uh, mathematical thinking can help experimental design. So to finish, I want to briefly outline three future directions. So first, understanding the robustness of cosmo during evolution. Second, predicting the causal relationships in complex microbial communities. Third, artificial selection of microbial communities. So these all look kind of different, but they all have the common theme of dealing with biological complexity. So the first is understanding the robustness of cosmo during evolution. So we already have the controls down, right? So from phenotypes of cooperators, we know the ancestral communities, birth rate and the viability in a quantitative sense. So now the real deal is to understand how the robustness changes as cells evolve. And we know it's complex, right? Because each population would harbor multiple genotypes and each mutation could have multiple phenotypic consequences and the new interactions could evolve. But we feel that we are in a uh, we are in an advantage position because because the model predictions right because we can make model predictions, and when model predictions deviate from experiments, then maybe something unexpected is happening. For example, new interactions might have evolved, and from this we hope to learn what phenotypes drive different community robustness, and so unlike the current work um, in the field where they try to study robustness of complex communities, right, where they only have phenomenological, phenomen phenomenology and correlation. We really hope to get mechanistical insights, which will help the future engineering of communities of more or less robustness. So second is predicting the causal relationship in complex microbial communities. So with the advance of sequencing technologies, right, we have more and more these types of data accumulating. So this is sort of like the species density um, of a bacteria in, a, say, a female 
uh, a vagina, and the, some of these females will contract the bacterial vaginosis. So what microbiologists are really interested in understanding is, for example, can you make high-quality you know, hypothesis on, on causal relationships? Right? By causality, I mean X causes Y if perturbing X can perturb Y. But the most of these studies are not per perturbational. If you can perturb a species, of course you will know, right? Like if you perturb X, you can, you, you can perturb Y. But given these observational data, how far can you go in deducing causal relationships? So there are existing frameworks, such as Granger causality and the state-space reconstruction. But again, it's not clear to us how applicable these are to communities where species interact via chemical mediators. So Alex Yuan, a graduate student in the lab, is trying to understand how effective these frameworks are when applied to microbial communities. And I feel this work is important in the sense, of, say, similar to Babak's work, right, where it, um, it educates biologists, including ourselves, about the th possible theoretical limitations of these theories, theoretical tools, so, they, so that we will become informed consumers right, of these theoretical tools. And the third is artificial selection of microbial communities. Right? So, so we are eager to test our theoretical predictions experimentally. So one possibility for community function is cosmo growth rate. Because right? I've shown you that if we don't apply community selection, that is, every community line gets propagated, gets to reproduce you know, one newborn community, then we see this variation. Right? So some are fast growing, some are e slower growing. So if we select for fast growing communities, using strategies predicted to be effective versus strategies predicted not to be effective, do we indeed see that difference in efficacy of selection? A second possibility is to, um, have, uh, to select on E. coli, E. coli co-culture, where the first E. coli converts substrate to tryptophan, and the second one converts tryptophan to indigo. And indigo is a color that you dye your blue jeans. And uh, our collaborators showed that Actually, this pathway, if you split the pathway into two E. coli, you have a higher yield than a single pathway in a superbug. So that really calls for the, the, the importance of selecting communities. And we are, of course, very uh, interested in, sele uh, in simulating selection of complex communities. Um, complex communities where different types of interactions are engaged so that we want to see whether there are any general principles emerging from looking at the selection of different complex communities. And if such general principles should emerge, then we'll be emboldened to go to the wild and select wild um, communities for useful function. So with this, I would like to thank the former and current lab members. I feel very privileged to work this, with this highly talented group of people and to um, push the, um, the interface of biology and math forward. Now I want to also add that starting this year, I started to write lay audience stories about the discovery process of each of the papers published right, since 2019. And the story I covered in this talk is in The Devil in the Closet, and then we have other stories. So you can find um, these stories in either of the three um, outlets. So what I want to do in this is I want to tell the, um, tell the trainees the behind the scenes stories of, how, of these discoveries so that they don't feel too frustrated if they encounter you know, setbacks in their projects. And also I feel very gratified that my administrative assistants and my parents start to understand what I do. And it was surprisingly gratifying. I didn't expect I would be so gratified by their understanding what I do, but it is true. So with this, I would uh, um, be happy to take questions. And this is a summary slide again, and thank you very much. So Chinese first. Yes. So can you use like a Cosmo framework to like change the cooperation ratio? Like say like one person is interested in like two things, one person needs two things, but everyone's reading one and they need one. Does that change like how they the ratio of population or social interaction? Yeah, yeah. So we actually thought about this, but I don't have the manpower to do this because I get distracted with other problems, right? So we could have we definitely, one could definitely do such experiments. I still have not done a theoretical prediction. I want to actually do, think about it theoretically before I do the experiment. But you could ask questions, right? If you have three strains, they each depend on each other versus I depend on you, you depend on me, like the pairwise dependence, 
how would it affect the robustness? You can ask all these fun questions, but we have not had time to think about this. But that's a great question. Yes. So you mentioned, for example, cooperators versus cheaters, where the cheater basically takes but doesn't give. That's right. I assume that you also considered the possibility of not cheaters, but herders or killers. That is, they give something that's toxic. That's a very good question. So we actually, in the paper, I didn't, you know, one of the papers we considered these, uh, like, toxin warfares, right? So I tried to something to kill you, you tried something to kill me. So that actually, so for that interaction, so first of all, you have this interesting behavior of like the not that signaling, right? So in the sense that the, the survival of the first, right? Like if you are up at upper hand, then it's by stable, then you, are, then you win. But if I'm at the upper hand at the beginning, then I win. So you have the by stability and they don't intermix. In fact, we tried all six combinations, right? Like I help you, you don't help me back. I hurt you and you help me. I hurt you, you hurt me back. And you know, like six different types. The only type that would induce intermixing is strong cooperation. Right, mutual, mutually beneficial interactions lead to that. And of course, if cells clump to each other, they will mix. But if the if the pattern is driven by fitness effects of interactions, strong cooperation is the only interaction that would induce this mixing. Right, so. There are certainly medical situations in which herders go after each other. That's right. That's right. So you have this very interesting by by stability phenomenon. That's right. You won't have species coexistence. You have the, uh, but if it's a spatially structured environment, you can imagine, right? Like this, in this location, this wins, in that location, that wins. You still, have, you still can have global coexistence, yet locally, it's mono existence, right? So. Yes, please. Um, so, lots of interactions between organisms are not cooperative, and a lot of the time, if you have a potentially cooperative interaction, that's right. And cheaters win. Right. Um, now, there are many millions, I guess, of cooperating communities, but I wonder if these are using a, a discoverable general principle to avoid cheaters, or whether each one is special and unique and has you know, a special wrinkle that prevents cheaters. That's right. It's hard, hard work. So I, it's okay. So I think that's a great question. So Bruce was asking about right, the, the, um, how universal these mechanisms are. So I would say spatial organization, my spatial structure, seems to me it's a, such a, uni, you know, like such a um, uh, prevalent mechanism. Right? So if you're interacting in a spatially structured environment, the self-organization would like, exclude cheaters. And that people have shown this for you know, intra-population cooperation. That's true. That's what I was talking about, the king selection. If you live with your family members, right? if you're a cooperator, your children's a cooperator, you preferentially interact with cooperators and cheaters, and then cooperators win. Right? So that is a mechanism I feel is very universal. But I think adaptive race, I feel it's all, but that's stochastic, right? Stochastically, you would win. But that buys cooperators time to evolve, say, recognition mechanisms, right? So in the, in the other sense, for partner choice, I would agree with you, right? Each system could use something different, right? Like the recognition system between legume and rhizobia, where they let the they support the nitrogen fixing rhizobium to invade versus not, maybe very idiosyncratic to that. For each system, like the squid and this luminescent bacteria may be using different molecular mechanisms. But in the end, it's all partner choice, right? In the sense that if you have a homogeneous populations of partners, you're able to single out that useful one, right, and for yourself. But we actually, in some sense, I, it's actually very difficult. So that's another advantage of using Cosmo, right? Because it's actually sometimes very difficult to tease these apart in complex systems, right? So let's think about the legume and the rhizobia, right? So the rhizobia gets into the nodule, it forms this nodule. Intrinsically, it's a spatially structured environment. It's impossible to do experiment without spatially structured environment. So in this kind of system, it's very hard to, right, to really tell the contribution from spatially structured environment, in the sense, you know, I can have a root, right? I can have root, I have nodules, and then this one is providing a lot of, you know, this one is good one, this one is bad one. But because of this one is bad one, the root here would just die off, right? But this maybe have nothing to do with recognition, but it's just like, you're not feeding me, I'm not feeding you. It's a spatially structured environment, very similar to Cosmo. But for this one, you know, this gives, 
six magic rings just gives photosynthesis. It will grow, you know, bigger, taller. I mean, bigger, you know, like more, you know, more, uh, more biomass. So in this case, it's actually very hard to tell, right? Uh, is to tell like how much contribution is from spatially structured training environment because you cannot do a well mixed control, and how much is from partner choice, right? But in this system, in our system, we can control exactly where well mixed versus not well mixed, right? We can, we can, you know, tease them apart. But so to to give a summary to the answer to your question, I would believe these mechanisms, in a general sense, are general. But for partner choice, the molecular details could differ from one system to the next. Yes? I was curious about the typical photosynthesis model that we have here. Have we noticed or have we looked at mutation rates to see if they can, so that the egg here has a high mutation rate? So we have not um, looked at the, we have not measured the mutation rate. So in fact, the initial wave of mutations, we believe are largely pre-existing, like from Louis Delbruck's, you know, kind of thing, similar thinking. When you grow them up, because your population size is large, you already have these pre-existing mutations. And then when you apply that, you know, the selection pressure, like the adaptation to lysine limitation, so these pre-existing mutations, that's the first wave. But then after the first wave, the second wave mutations do show up. And, uh, um, and I also know that yeast, when they are stressed, the mutation rate goes up. But I have not really compared the mutation rate in the cheater versus cooperator. So it's possible that you might observe that and let it go longer. Yeah, let, yes, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. That's right. We have not really noticed like, the appearance of, the, of mutators, right? But we have not done the evolution experiments for that long. Because even the first tens of generations are kept, have kept us busy for, for a while, like the evolution of new interactions. I, we didn't expect it was that rapid. Right, so. Thank you very much. Thank you.